Good evening, folks. <laughs> How's everyone doing? All right, all right. Well, it's a lively uh, day today. We just have, uh, I'll just get you caught up on a few announcements if you did not receive those from our brother Thad. Um, let me tell you the ones that I just got as I came in the door. Um, Sister Washington uh, went to the hospital, and she was uh, she's now at home resting, uh, recovering from AFib. Uh, Ty Benjamin is out with her two children. They apparently are catching something, and she's out with them today. Our sister Olivia is not feeling well today, and she's going to be at home. I think uh, she was looking for someone to take her class this afternoon, so I believe there's an alternate on the list. Uh, our brother Jerry Reynolds um, has surgery tomorrow for his skin cancer and also is still dealing with his AFib, and he's looking forward to a time where all that will be gone, just like we all are for uh, him. So please keep him in your prayers. I did not see Brother Benjamin. I'm assuming that he might be here. He may, hopefully he has recovered uh, from his flu. And Monty Dunbar, uh, is he still home, Monty? Yeah. Still home, still down. All right, you guys, this flu isn't playing and all these other things out there, so be safe, take care of yourself. Uh, now, remember we have... Uh, uh, Kaylin Frazier and Xander Salazar, our new brother and sister in Christ that are with us. So the family, we got a big responsibility along with their families to look after them, watch out for them, talk to them, and make sure they are encouraged. Next Sunday, we have Potluck. Uh, group 2 has set up and clean up. And we'll have song practice after that. It's, uh, again, good to see the Dill Days here. Love seeing you. Um, and let's see. Remember the light posts. If you have any issues, check with Sister Verne Wine. If your link has expired, please talk to her. Uh, and last but not least, the gospel meeting is May 26th through the 29th. So please, please start advertising and talking about that. Our brother Michael Height uh, from Bear Valley Institute will be the guest speaker for that event. Uh, we'll check on any other announcements and get them out. If you have others, we'll get out later, but we'll get ready and prepare ourselves to go into tonight's service with a song. Good evening. First song this evening is going to be number 465. It's 465. I apologize in advance, but my voice is not working super well with me tonight, so I know y'all will be able to pick up the slack. So 465, sing the first and second verses. <clears throat> Flee as a bird to your mountain, thou who art weary of sin. Go to the clear flowing fountain. Thank you. 
Speed it up for the second verse. He will protect the Invitation song will be number 405, and we'll sing the first and third verses. It's 405. Good evening. It's a pleasure to talk to you all this evening. So John, at the end of his gospel, John 20, and beginning in verse 30, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Uh, many look at John's gospel as an example of journey to faith. John himself talks about, he was very specific in what he included, and that it would lead you to believe in who Jesus was. Um, and so I believe he intentionally inserted Nicodemus into his gospel as an example of that journey to faith. John's gospel is the only place we find Nicodemus, and tonight we're just going to take a look at that journey to faith through the uh, story of Nicodemus, through what we have of Nicodemus in John's Gospel. So we begin that journey in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. I'm not going to read all of that this evening. I would encourage you to go back and look through those verses on your own. Uh, but we will go ahead and read verse 1 and 2. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? As we continue to read through uh, John 3, we see that Nicodemus comes by night, comes to see Jesus. They go through a discourse back and forth talking uh, through why Jesus is here and uh, about the kingdom. As mentioned, this is the first time we see Nicodemus. It's the beginning of his journey. He comes as a seeker, seeking answers, inquiring of Jesus, but he also comes at night uh, or under the cover of darkness, which I think gets alluded to some when uh, 
at the end of this, verses 19 through 21, is Jesus is wrapping up and he says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Uh, so all of us begin our own journeys the same way as inquiring minds, sometimes secretly for fear of uh, what others may think. But then we move on to the next stage of the middle of our journey, testing and growth. Uh, and so the next spot that we see Nicodemus is in John 7, verses 43 through 52. So here Jesus has just finished speaking at the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, which was one of the three major feasts that were commanded for the Jews in Deuteronomy 16, um, verse 16. Uh, as Jesus finishes up, the officers who were there to arrest him, uh, they don't. They come back to the chief priests and Pharisees who ask why they didn't arrest. And they're like, we've never heard anybody speak this way, the way that Jesus does. Uh, the Pharisees answer, have you also been deceived? Have, have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Uh, and then we see Nicodemus come in in an attempt to defend Jesus using the law. And he says, we read in verse 15, Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So while it's still not open support, we see that uh, Nicodemus does at least attempt to defend Jesus to his peers here, uh, but as soon as he is cut down by his peers, we see nothing further is told here. It doesn't seem that he continues on. Uh, in our own walks of faith, we also cannot just remain inquirers or seekers. We have to go through testings, uh, testing of our faith and beliefs and questions. Sometimes those come from our self, so internal questions about what we're hearing or reading and whether or not we believe those things. Sometimes it's questions or persecution from others. Uh, James talks about this in James 1, verse 2 through 4, where he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so that leads us to the last spot that we see Nicodemus, and that is at the end of John's Gospel. John 19, verses 38 through 42. Jesus has just died on the cross. Uh, we see that Joseph and Arimathea went to uh, request for, from Pilate Jesus' body, and Nicodemus joins him. Verse 39, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Uh, so here we see that Nicodemus helps to remove and bury uh, Jesus. Uh, how sad he must have been. This was supposed to have been his Messiah. But despite a uh, seeming defeat, he now shows open support. It's not like he could have taken off of a cross that stood up on a hill in front of everybody uh, without being seen. Um, and much like Nicodemus, we also have to reach that final stage, like James talked about in James 1, 3, that steadfastness. Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Uh, so as we reach that final stage, as we complete our faith and enter into the waters of baptism, that's not the end. That's where our next journey begins. The journey continues from there. We start into a journey of growth. Paul in Colossians 1, verse 21 says, And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, 
He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So as we start that journey of faith, we walk by faith, not by sight, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Um, we can still be weak in the faith as we begin that journey. Much like uh, Paul talks about in Romans 14, 1. It's for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. But that's fine because, like we said, it is a journey. And we'll once again work our way through the steps of that journey. Um, but we can also go off the path. We can still fall away. 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul writes, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Uh, so it's important that we continue to strive to make sure that we stay on the correct path uh, so that we journey to heaven. Uh, Peter gives us some words of wisdom in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. Again, I'd encourage you to look through those on your own. Um, it's one of those things I try to look at every day to remind myself of the things to work through, to build upon, to make sure that it stay uh, firmly rooted in the Word. So tonight we uh, quickly looked through Nicodemus as an example of maturing in faith, is progressing, taking that journey of faith. Uh, even as a leader of the Jews, Nicodemus is still a man with a nature much like ours, kind of like James talked about uh, when he talked about Elijah. So I ask tonight, which stage and of which journey do you find yourself? Are you still in that first journey that leads to baptism? Maybe still just beginning your inquiring, maybe starting to have questions or uh, feel some of the questioning from others about your faith and beliefs. Or maybe you're ready to complete that faith by entering into the waters of baptism. Or perhaps you've already done that and you're now on that second journey, walking through the post-baptism Christian walk. Uh, maybe you've fallen away and uh, looking to get back on the path. Whatever your need, whatever uh, we can help you with, the invitation is yours, the lesson is yours. We ask that you come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected. Oh, thou fount of every blessing, soon my heart.
Let's bow. Eternal Spirit and God, our Father, make up heaven and earth, creator of all good things. Father, we are so grateful and thankful that we can come to you as our God on another beautiful Wednesday night, a night that you never promised us, but a night that through your grace, your mercy, your kindness, and your love, you allowed us to be here. Father, we praise your name this night, and we give you the glory for all things. Thank you, Father, that you are a merciful God who can do all things. Help us, Father, to realize that and to give you the glory. And Father, help us always to die to self in all that we do. Now, Father, give us this opportunity tonight to make the most of our time as we um, immerse ourselves in your word. Help us, Father, to open our hearts and our minds and rid ourselves of the distractions that will take us this time away from you. Father, please be with every family here. Touch those who have needs, Father, and help us to be open to help and to open our hearts as well. Father, thank you so much for loving us and be with us now, Father, as we continue to study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you, man. Good work. Good job, brother. I didn't know we were staying here when we didn't leave. Though. That's where I'm going to be at the next time. But I don't want to leave up there. <laughs> I was going to go up there, but they told me I had to wear that. I'll just stand up here. Let's go ahead and get started. My my uh, my mic died on me before I even got started. Something is guaranteed. Just sorry, I put too I, much I just, from it. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, brother. That's all right. Well, Sunday, 
I had the opportunity to go ahead and start, chap, uh, finish up chapter 11, and we got into chapter 12. Now, I did have some handouts, so Allegra has handouts for anyone who might need them. And if we need to make copies, we will. In Sunday's lesson, I, I guess I'll do this. And Sunday, we, um, we did complete it, Acts chapter 11, and we got into Acts 12, and we had an extensive discussion about Herod the king, who, of course, was identified as Herod Agrippa I. We, um, uh, Herod decided to harass the church, as we discussed, and he killed James, the brother of John with the sword, the sword. And I told you that through history, we understand that the, uh, the killing by the sword of these, from this particular incident, was by beheading. However, Peter, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, I have smaller notes here, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, uh, Herod decided that he was going to go ahead and uh, kill Peter. But what, he what happened is that the day that he decides to kill Peter, after he had arrested him, he realized that he could not kill him because, because that particular day was a Jewish holiday. And we talked about that on Sunday. And it was not lawful for the Jews, at least at that point, to have a trial or a sentencing during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is, of course, known as the Passover. So at this point in our study of Acts, does anyone know how many times now Peter has been arrested? Anybody know? A bunch. <laughs> yes, ma'am. He's been arrested three times, Sharika. Boy, I'll tell you, if I had some gold, I'd give it to her. So he's been arrested three times up to this point. Now, I also told you during one of those times, uh, he was let out of prison by an angel. Uh, Luke records that event for us in Acts chapter 5, verse 19. So I suggest it to you that Herod more than likely was aware that Peter kept escaping, and in fact, more than likely, he got out one time by an angel. And so we're going to see that. I told you that because of the way that he now treats Peter and what we're going to see happens to happen to Peter. So if we could, let's read Acts chapter 12 verses 5 through 19, and if I could, I'd like to have two readers, one for Acts 12, 5 through 11, and the second for Acts 12, um, verses 12 through 19. So let's go ahead and read today's lesson. Acts 12, 5 through 11. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. 
when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, uh, 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 Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath seen his angel and have delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Amen. Thank you, Brother Trotter. Okay, let's go ahead and grab 12 through 19. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhonda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stare among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my sister. A lot there. A lot there. So... What we're going to do is take our time and we're going to go through these, not all of the verses, but we're going to see if we can make understanding and application to a lot of the things that are actually said. So the first question that I have for you, oh, I'm sorry, that was where we talked Sunday. So the first question that I have for you, while Peter was in prison, what was the church doing? Praying. Praying. How often? Constantly, the church was praying. And that's interesting because we're going to see that the church prayers were answered. The church prayers were answered. But why is it important today for the church to be praying constantly? Ah, it's the thought question. Why is it important today that we be praying constantly? Constantly. Yes, Sharika. Sharika has her hands up. There is a verse in first, 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 first or second Thessalonians that say pray without ceasing. Okay. And, and okay. we and we gotta do that because that's one avenue to contact God with. And when you pray to God, he will listen and may or may not answer your prayers depending if it is his will or not. Okay. All right. Charles. Because there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Genesis 18, 14. Okay. Nothing too hard from the Lord. Who else? All right. Thad. Colossians 4. Uh, we should pray earnestly, if nothing else, for thanksgiving. And also, we should always pray that there's an open door for the gospel. Uh, Amen. So that's uh, Colossians 4th chapter. Okay, what else? Anybody else? Why should we be praying constantly? Look at the condition of the world today. Look at how many people we have out sick. Look at the amount of things that we could do for each other. What about James chapter 5 verse 16? Come on, brother, give him a mic. Get that last sentence of James chapter 5, verse 16 to everybody. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be, the he that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Your prayers 
your prayers avail much. Again, we keep saying, you're saints, you're Christians, you're of the body of Christ. You're the power of God working on this earth today. As saints, your prayers are strong. Yes, brother. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That's right. He cares for each and every one of us. Yes, Brother Gene. You mentioned the, the condition of the world today. Yesterday I was reading the old, some Old Testament scriptures. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 1, Habakkuk. verses... Habakkuk. 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 Okay. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Amen. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. That's our world today. That's our world today. That's our world today. And you know what? We're in it. We're in it. However, we got God on our side. Okay? And that was the situation that was occurring with Peter, James, and everybody else. All those apostles at a time when we talked about Caligula and we talked about Herod. We talked about all the things that were going on. Effective prayer by each of us. Yes, Sharika. Adding on to what Jean was saying, it seems like history is just repeating itself over and over again. But despite it all, we shouldn't worry because, like you said, that God is on our side. That's right. And all and through prayer, like you said, through prayer, and we should be able to overcome whatever the devil fools at us. Amen. Amen. There is no reason to worry. Again, we talked about it, yes, Sunday. We know the beginning, and we know the end. And all we have to do is take care of what God has given us today and take care of each other. Amen? Amen, that's it. That's it. So, now, I, I want to go ahead and tackle what we've read. And so, I'm, I'm going to break this down into four parts. Um, I think that way we'll get a clear understanding of what what really we have to focus on here tonight. Those four parts are, we're going to take a look at the Roman guards. Start with them. All I want you to do is focus on the guard. What happens with the guards? Then we're going to talk about Peter's treatment and his state of mind during that time. Then we'll go ahead and we'll talk about the angel and Peter's escape. And then finally, Peter's freedom, which is somewhat comical. Uh, has some uh, interesting things. So let's go ahead and start walking through this. Should have a slide. Okay, let's start off with the guards. Um, first, we recognize that Peter is chained between two soldiers. I think I have a... Okay, Peter's chained between two soldiers. The Bible documents uh, the two chains between the two soldiers. And Roman history suggests that they were either going to be bound by the hands or by the waist, all right, between two soldiers. Now, this is uh, not a standard practice for everyone that's captured on a battlefield. This is normally for someone who a king or someone has specifically said, I want you guys to make sure nothing happens to this individual. Well, you know what? They're going to make sure nothing happens to that individual because their life is at stake. And that's what we're beginning to see here. All right? So, verse 7 of what we have just read tells us that the chains fell off the hands. So, we already know how Peter was chained. He wasn't chained around the wrist. He was actually chained around his hands. Next there were guards at the door. All these guards. Boy, Peter must have really been important. Remember, uh, it, when it says that 
there, but the Bible, I think if you have New King, it says that it was before the door. Does King James say anything different? The uh, guards were before the door? Because in the New King James, that suggestion is that they were right outside the door, is what I'm suggesting to you. Before the door. Okay, so they were right outside of where Peter was changed. Next, there were more guards. Verse 10 informs us that there was a first and second post that was outside. Now what we're seeing is you've got a prison and then you have the city gates and outside. So where the prison is, Peter's got, when he escaped, has to get from the chains, past the door, to the gates to the iron gate. So he was under heavy guard. That's the point you need to walk away with. Throughout Peter's imprisonment, from the time he fell asleep in verse 6, until the time he walks out to that iron gate, led uh, to the which led to the city, in verse 10, during the presence of the angel, let me make sure I got this, uh, the guards were in, in this case, were in some form of an unconscious state. Okay? I want everybody to recognize that. Because here we have an angel that has somehow miraculously got in that prison. And we're going to talk about the angel separately. But what I want you to see is what's going on with the guards. For some reason... All of those guards were in some kind of a state. We don't know what type of a state they were in, but clearly they were unconscious or could not do anything to that angel as that angel had those shackles drop off of Peter and he escaped completely out of the prison and through the city. As a matter of fact, we know this because verse 18 says, As soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. They didn't know what happened to Peter. They did not know. All those guards and nobody knew what happened to Peter. Peter was just gone. As we look closer at verse 19... After the guards were examined, it tells us that Herod nor the soldiers knew what had happened. And unfortunately, out of anger, Herod and his frustration put all those soldiers to death. Now, on Sunday, I told you that a squad of soldiers was between four and seven soldiers, which made up a century. And if you look back at the text, you'll notice that Peter was guarded by four squads. Four squads. That should tell you if Herod, in his frustration, decided that none of you guys know what happened to, my, to Peter, who I said I was bringing out, guess how many died? Probably all four of those squads of soldiers were put to death. Just think about what's happening here. Okay, let's talk about Peter and his state of mind. I want you to think about the way Peter is kept in the prison in verse 8. He was likely bound in that prison naked. Okay? Not only was he bound to two soldiers, he was more than likely bound naked because the wording in verse 8 says, by the angel, gird yourself Put on your sandals, put on your garments. All suggest that he was stripped of everything that he had when he went into that prison. This is classical 
Roman humiliation and torture, folks. Classical. As a matter of fact, in, uh, there is a quote by John McRae, who published an article in, on Christian history in the uh, section in the Christianity Today magazine, and it talked about this specifically. And it says that Roman imprisonment was preceded by being stripped naked and then flogged, humiliated, painful, and bloody ordeal. The bleeding wounds were untreated, Prisoners sat in a painful leg and wrist chains. Mutilated, blood-stained clothing was not replaced even in the cold of winter. In his final moments, Paul asked for a cloak, presumably because it was cold. But in a Roman prison, he would have been stripped naked. Now, if you do any research on Roman soldiers and their use of captivity, especially if they were a warring class, anyone that was not put to death and was brought to prison was humiliated in this way. Was humiliated in this way. Peter, more than likely, sat in the prison naked. All right. Now, it makes you think about all the things that are going on. Now, if Peter experienced this, it may be why when Peter got dressed and uh, followed the angel, uh, as we see from the text that we read, his mind was just not all there at the time. Okay, verse, what, what does verse 9 tell us in your text? Okay, someone go ahead and read it. What does verse 9 say? Go ahead, go ahead and get the mic. Oh. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel but thought he saw a vision. See, when the angel got Peter and was leading him out, his mind was, as sometimes we say, discombobulated. He was in all kind of uh, sorts because of the condition that he had been kept in. He did not know what was done with that angel. Peter was in a strange state of consciousness he did, not, it, he did not come out of that state until verse 11. Oh, yes, yes ma'am, Allegra. Also, um, he was sleeping. So he may not have thought that he had awakened yet. That's right. He, he might have just, it, with the grogginess, being fatigued, with all the things that had happened to him, because we don't know the, all of the pieces of the arrest and how he was brought to that prison by, Rome, by the Roman soldiers. But based on history, it probably wasn't nicely. Okay? Allegra, go ahead. Also, I, I have been dreaming that I was awake and getting ready for work and then find out, you know, later on I wasn't, I was still asleep. So I was wondering, could it be something like that too? The question was, were you dressed? <laughs> uh, I think a lot of us go through these states where sometimes we're asleep, you know. I've heard of people who think they're eating, and all of a sudden they bit a hole in their pillow, you know. I, there's, there's states of consciousness when you are at a sleep point. Oh, man, them feathers are something else. Oh, I'm, <laughs> what? oh, oh Kay has a question, and then we'll come to the other side. Yes, okay. Maybe that angel just knocked him silly because I'm thinking <laughs> it says it smote him on the side. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't you say that yet. Wait till we get to the angel. You hold that point. Let's back up in seven, though. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And, and you know, if um, the angel had the power to make the guards unconscious, it looks like he could have gently woke Peter up instead of yeah. him. <laughs> Peter, I, I've, I've always thought about that. Uh, and I, it, it makes me think that Peter must have been very fatigued. He must have really been worn out when he was placed in prison between those two guards. For the angel to have smote him, to knock him, say, boy, get up, I'm trying to help you. You know, that's what was going on. So you're right, it, it was, uh, it, we're gonna talk about the angel, I'm gonna, <laughs> uh, yes, sir. You know, but it's, it's interesting that he's, he's not really questioning or he, it seems like a lot of reactions to seeing an angel or having the Lord speak to them was shock or fright or, mm -hmm. um, you know, something to that nature being, being like keeled over, but he didn't do that. He, he listened. He arose quickly. He got his sandals on. He lay, so there's, there's got to be a, a somewhat of a, of a understanding maybe, or mm -hmm. um, somewhat of a, well, I, I better listen to what's going on here. Uh, but it, but it's interesting that he that he 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 might have been naked too because in First Peter thirteen, First uh, Peter one thirteen. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you as a revelation of Jesus Christ. So that language is just very interesting that he he said that's that right. later. That's right. Now now let me let me make a point about he. He went along with the angel. He, you know, there was. Is this Pe is this Peter's first time dealing with an angel? What what happened? You remember the, the last time he dealt with an angel was with Cornelius, and he saw that sheet come down or something like a sheet, and even an angel told them to go with those men when they were some so. So here we have Peter is apparently used to dealing with angels. Now he might have been out of sorts, but he somehow recognized that angel. Okay, good point. Good point. Yes, sir. Just sorry, just one more. Oh, wait, it, wait, it, wait a minute. And it's just interesting how he he goes. I mean, this is the same guy that that cut off a Roman soldier's ear, right? Oh, yes, so, sir. So, and then he'll go on and Peter and talk about submission to government, submission to masters. Just. I mean, just seeing his overall maturity is mm -hmm. is interesting to. He's grown a lot. He has grown a lot. Yes, sir. I guess we don't lose sight of the fact that Peter was in a pretty deep sleep. He probably had his um, CPAP machine in prison. So, <laughs> because the Bible said they shine the light in, they don't hit him. go to that verse yet. Yeah. We're on the we're on Peter. Wait, but you know, but. The fact of the matter is, Peter saw Jesus go back to heaven, and they rejoiced in Acts chapter 4 when they were beaten for Jesus. So he was sure that he was, you know, it didn't matter what they did to him, he was going to carry on about his day until he went back to see the Lord. So Peter was in a deep sleep in my mind. He was in deep sleep. Yeah. Regardless of not having power in the cell and the CPAP wasn't working. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> we know about those CPAPs, all right? All right. So, it is, <laughs> all right, okay, I'm going to keep going. Y'all just messing with me now. You're going to make me stay up here. Um, let me see where I am. Okay, so it took him a while to come out of the state, and now let's talk about this angel. All right, because I got time. Has the first bell rang? All right, good, good, don't ring it. All right, the first thing you should notice here. Neither back in Acts 5.19, uh, nor now, was there a description of an angel. Right? There is no description of the angel there. We never see a description of an angel. Why is this important? Yes, ma'am. So that if they don't worship the angel. Okay. She said, Sharika says, so that they don't worship an angel. How about all of you or me or all these other people who read the Bible just like you and say, aha, I now know what an angel looks like. 
What's the first thing that somebody's going to do? Build an idol to an angel. Because the angel will all of a sudden, okay, uh, no, she's going to give me my, my cue. Uh, the angel will all of a sudden become more important than God himself and all the other things. That's how idols work. So here's what we know. We don't know, see a picture of the angel, but here's what we do see. And I'm just going to put them all up there. We, we saw, oh, okay, you guys can see them because I'm going to run through them. Yes, Kevin. I just want to say, from the Old Testament, we learned that angels look like men. Yep. Um, yes, sir. When the Lord and the angels came to Abraham before they went to Sodom and Gomorrah, once they got there, it says that the men went into the city. That's right. So they were angels and they were men. So their description was just like looking at a person. Mm -hmm. So an angel could take the appearance of a man. Were cherubim and seraphim considered angels? Spiritual beings. And let me tell you, when you start studying about the cherubim and the seraphim, that's a scary looking thing. All right? So, yes, an angel can take the form of a person. But what we want to make sure people understand is, you, it, even if it takes the form of a person, you can't go out there and build an idol of this angel that you saw. All right? And that's extremely important in this part of the scripture. Yes, sir. Certainly in this case, it's not important what the angel looked like here. That's right. But if it wasn't that's important, right. it would have said it. That's right. And, well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to hold there because there's another point about that exactly. So here's what we see. We saw that it, the angel stood by Peter. It stood by him. That's what our Bible says. It cast a light in the prison. So whatever form it was in, it was very bright inside that prison. It struck Peter on the side, and it also lifted him up, according to the scripture. It had power because those chains fell off of Peter at the time in verse 7. It moved and it covered Peter in such a way that nobody saw him leave. Have you ever thought about that? He was moving along with this idol, this, this angel who cast a light in the cave and yet nobody saw Peter and that angel go down there to that iron gate. Interesting. Its presence caused that iron gate going into the city to, the Bible says, open on its own. That's a fascinating thing about just a clip of what we can gather about this angel. So now we got to stop here and y'all got to come back next Wednesday. <laughs> but, no, I can't go any further. All right, let's go. I want to, but I can't. Uh, just think about that. Go ahead and complete your reading. Um, because again, the prayers of the church are being answered. And we're seeing how they're being answered. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, Kevin, real quick. Back in Luke, um, after Jesus rose from the dead, there were two men walking, and Jesus came along and went with them. Good point. And at one point, it says in Luke 24, verse 16, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Somehow, Amen. they just couldn't picture him until later on. That's right. And something restrained them from seeing. And maybe that's what happened with everyone else, the guards and all that. I don't know. That's right. It is, it is absolutely fascinating when we take instances like that, when we take instances like Paul on his way to Damascus. Remember what happened? That light? We know that Paul had what on his eyes? Some, something like scales. He didn't have no fish scales on his eyes. 
He had something like scales that fell off. But what about all the guards? Weren't sure if they saw anything or not. They heard, they heard Paul talking. There's different instances in the scripture where we can talk about what we can glean about these angels. And then we'll go on when we talk about Rhoda and meeting Peter and what they said about her. Seeing his angel. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Our precious and heavenly Father, we, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come and just, just glean pieces from your precious word to learn about you, to learn about your son Jesus Christ, to learn about all that you have given to us to understand. We ask you, Father, that you allow us to continue to study your precious word so that we'll become stronger in our application to others as we reach out to this world and try to bring more understanding about who you are as God and your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for this time that we've had together, and guide us now and protect us on our way home. This we ask in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Class is yours. Let me get rid of my baby.